Okay, I'm doing this code review several weeks after having written it, which is not a wise decision, but we're going to go through it anyways, because I think it's a good thing to do regardless. Okay. So, well, okay. First, the title of what, what is this commit about? This is back when I added basic leaderboards. Uh, I think there's a visual element for the leaderboards. Where is the visual element? Yeah, there's a, there's a page for it. Okay. And there's a folder for leaderboard because I have this other uh, class that handles some logic unique to leaderboards. <clears throat> okay. But besides that, I also added a huge package. And I really don't like adding big packages or depending on libraries, but this one was important because my database is in AWS. And I based a lot of my logic on AWS specific stuff, which actually makes me think of the whole uh, vendor independence thing and how that's like not, not super reliable because uh, part of this was based off of AWS's identity management. <clears throat> so as a cheap hack, what I did was I distributed the the um, the access key and secret key to my users as a as a single string, um, with some obfuscation applied to it, and then my program takes this string and sort of decodes it into an access key and secret key. It accomplishes two things: uh, my users want to have an easy way to gain access to my leaderboards. And so I figure, well, we'll just call it a password because we're going to have users and passwords or usernames and passwords in the system eventually anyways. So might as well just say like, oh, it's, it's kind of like you already have a password in my game. You just have to, you know, give the right password. So that makes intuitive sense to users, I think. And it needs to be a single string. So it's just easy to copy and paste. Right. <clears throat> and then, um, and then some other second thing that it accomplishes. Uh, oh yeah, well, like they need to get access to my system, right? They need to get the secret key, access key and secret key. And it's it's much easier <clears throat> to just do this quick and dirty thing where I just have, have them have direct access to the API to upload to my database. And I can of course restrict the access key and secret key um, uh, per the permissions on it. Like I created a user. I was trying to be at least a little bit security conscious about it. Um, and, and then they can, right. They can use the API and they can upload and they can download from the leaderboards and that'll make the leaderboards essentially work. <clears throat> so that's the, the broad overview description of it. I hopefully like you're not, yeah, I didn't draw a diagram or anything, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. <clears throat> but yeah, so we're going to look at the code, right? That's why there's this package here is because it's an AWS based leaderboard system. And yep, there it needs to be in the HTML as well. And uh, this is kind of an artifact. I had page manager at the top level of my source uh, of my source code structure. And I figured it makes sense to put the page manager in the pages folder rather than have it just floating around with the 80 other files that are not organized in there. <clears throat> so we're going to see this artifact around everywhere because stuff from page manager is used in a lot of places. Uh, config. This looks like a huge change, but it's not. I think what actually happened is I, wait, is username and password in here? That would make sense. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I added. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Storing username and password in local storage. Cause that's the storage that I'm using for everything right now. And so config goes to local storage. Storing username and password in local storage is probably not the right long-term solution. The right long-term solution is probably to put it in a cookie, I'm guessing, but I don't really know. And it's not 
terribly important right now because security is not that important of a thing right now. Like if it's in local storage or it's in a cookie, my program can still read it. And if my program can read it, then anyone else's program can read it as far as I'm concerned. So I, 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 I hope I'm right about that, but I'm not a security expert. So at least I'm not asking users to make up a password because they could, that's, that's what I don't want to happen is someone puts a password that is actually important to them in my game and I screw up. That's not a good thing. Uh, but so far I think this is okay. We'll see. And I try to, I try to be transparent about this stuff, but most people like don't really care about the details of how I implement it. Um, database client, right? Yeah. So I like to put stuff in a client to uh, isolate my any library that I use. I try to make a class just for interacting with any any library that I have to interact with. <clears throat> and in the process of defining this class, I'm also sort of defining a, a, an interface. Not an interface in the sense of um, like an actual interface specific to JavaScript, but an inter interface in the more, more generic sense where we're going to have a set of, of public functions like here, look, we, we query, we can query and we can put if better score. Those are the two main things that this needs to do query for your, and this is all leaderboard related stuff. So of course your query, <clears throat> you're going to be asking for top scores for a particular, uh, for a particular song. Okay, and that's all going to be in this query request. And it, it's, uh, I love the fact that I use query requests here because it's generic, right? And it sounds, it sounds good. You want things to be generic. Uh, what's actually in a query request? Well, we can go find out. Uh, it's just the song hash. That's all you need in order to look up a, a song on the leaderboard. And a song hash is, is literally a, um, I forget what hashing algorithm I used specifically, but it is a hash of the parsed notes of a song. So there you go. And this params thing is, this, I believe it's specific to the AWS client, right? Um, yeah, there's the name of the table and uh, the index and all the implementation details that are specific to DynamoDB, that stuff is like hidden in here, quote unquote hidden. It's, it's isolated at least. Um, great, so params goes into this document client. Document client is actually what AWS calls it. Yeah, okay, seems a little bit weird, but yeah. And this, this is a, uh, we do a promise. And then after we get the result, what do we do? We, we go through all the items and the results and we parse them into a query response entry. And then finally we return a query response, which is an array of entries. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, constructor. Okay. This is a little bit interesting, right? So we have a username and a password. The username is what actually gets sent to the database as the user's name. And then it gets displayed to other users when they, uh, when they download the, the results. So, uh, obviously that poses some security risks. And I think I mitigated it a little bit. Man, I hate talking about security though, honestly, because I'm I'm really bad at it and I just know I'm screwing it up. But let's take a look at username. What do I do? What's the best effort that I do? Well, I define some valid characters, uh, word characters. So I think that's uppercase, lowercase, alphanumeric and hyphens and underscores, something like that. So I think that's pretty benign. And then this up and this 
dollar sign means it has to match the whole word and then this the star means it's zero or or more yeah so that seems pretty safe that seems pretty benign so as long as the username is valid it'll it'll return a uh, a username uh object it doesn't re return a class it returns an object right yeah um and then there's some length restrictions as well, which I don't communicate very well to the users. I remember that being a problem, but but we don't talk about that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's okay. I kind of like how I implemented that. And then a password. So this the password is what contains the my my obfuscate my deobfuscator. And what? Well, okay. Password of a string. Is the val is the password valid? Then return. Okay. How do we know if it's valid? Uh, it has to contain valid characters. I made it. I uh, added this extra character here. What is that? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, because there is a slash in in one of the keys, so I needed to allow that. And then what else? It needs to be the right length. Okay. And then we parse a password. Okay. What? Who? Who calls the password parsing? I don't know. I hope I'll I'll see that somewhere exactly. So or somewhere. Parse the password. Uh. Like obviously the password parsing needs to happen at some point, but it, yeah, it, it takes the the string apart and, and gets the actual. Access key and secret key. You, uh, you can. Uh, it's it's really not important how how I do the swapping. Uh, it's it's mostly a waste of time. Okay, so that's the that's the username and password. And the database client gets sees two strings. Perhaps later, it might make sense to send them a username and password abstraction. But since this is the only place where we need a username and password, I think it's okay to have the work being done here. Later, we might need username and password to be used elsewhere. So it would make sense to store the username and password object rather than just the string. Credentials, right, right. Password dot keys, dot keys. Where does keys get set? Oh, in the constructor, it calls password dot parse. Okay, that's fine. Right here. Right here is where the that gets set. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I kind of violated a clean code rule, I think, because I didn't expect the constructor to actually have the side effect of setting the keys. So that's kind of lame. I, sh I feel like, yeah, maybe I should fix that. I'm going to make a note. Uh, Here, you can watch me write my note. Um, yeah, I might change my mind on that one. Because constructors kind of almost always have side effects, but yeah, that was a little bit weird. Anyways, I answered my question though. That's that's where parse happens. Ooh, should parse be public? I'll make a note of that. Okay. Yep, and we get the, we put the keys in the credentials object, and then we can make a client. 
And now AWS is happy and we can do a query and we can do a, uh, and we can do a put, put a better score. Yeah. So I'm going with a very minimalist approach to what goes in my database. I only want to store everyone's best scores and I'm only storing the scores. I think I'm also storing a timestamp and I think I also score a uh, store, a song title, but those two things are only in there for debugging purposes. So I can roughly figure out what has gone wrong. Cause I, I kind of anticipate a user asking me uh, a question like that at some point in time. So um, I guess that's just a little bit of paranoia. There's there's so few users that it really doesn't matter at this point. Uh, I could have gone any other way, you know, but it, it might help me. We'll see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if, if anyone's interested in, in how to actually set this up, I could go into detail about how you use DynamoDB for this. But this is just DynamoDB specific stuff. This is how you use DynamoDB to to do a put, you know? Yeah. Oh, and I, I had, I'm, you know, if I'm getting a timestamp, I want to make sure I'm using some standard for the timestamp, some well-established standard. Okay. So that's a database client. We can query and we can put that's, and there's usernames and passwords. Uh, and there's a put request. You need the song hash, the song name, and the score. Yep, that makes sense. And a put response, there's no put response. There's a, it's an empty object. But at least I'm calling it a put response, right? Uh, and then if I change the, that interface, it'll be this thing that I'm changing. Just making sure everything looks cool. Uh, what did I do to local storage? I think I remember this being here and having no use and I kind of just forgot to get rid of it. What else? I moved some logic, I think. I moved some logic into, because I probably needed this. Yeah. I needed this hashing elsewhere for leaderboards. That makes sense. Previously, I was just using this kind of stuff for local storage, but now I wanted it in uh, for hashing because I use the hash for leaderboards. Yeah, so I moved that out and I, re I renamed some stuff. And then this comment, uh, I looked at it and I decided it wasn't useful anymore. And that's totally fine. That's totally fine. And I got to move the library into something even more niche and specific. So that's great. P5C, oh yeah, that's just the artifact for moving page manager. Uh, leaderboard, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. This is a, this is a page. I can tell it's a page because it's an abstract class. And then there's this thing here that usually happens. And look, it's, uh, ooh, okay. I see page controls and I see radio table. Yeah, that reminds me, I did this huge uh, abstraction for, for the tables, right? I did an abstraction for like the UI elements and some of the, some of the data structure elements for, for displaying tables of information. That's right. Okay, so this is a page and here's some UI code. Oh, this doesn't look so bad, this UI code. A heading, we have background, we've got the ID, status text, status text. Leaderboard has a status text. Oh, right. I probably needed the status text because I expected the leaderboard to fail to load pretty regularly if the user hasn't set up their login information yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and page controls are like little left and right buttons that that let you go between pages although i don't think it's likely that users will see multiple pages of scores at this point i put it in there anyways because it was probably really easy to just copy and paste in there Yeah, that was probably that was probably copy and paste. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and these are the column headings. Okay. Cool. So that's the UI stuff. The leaderboard list is maybe more interesting. We've got this state thing here, which I'm still not super comfortable with, but I have it everywhere. Every like paginated list, I have one. Yeah, I might want to get rid of that eventually, but I don't know. I don't know how exactly yet. Mm, I wish that was public. Eh, I'll find that later. Or not, doesn't matter. Initialize coin. Oh, okay. It's been a while since I've looked at something like this, so I'm just making sure I understand it. The main thing is you kick off the loading of the leaderboard, and then you initialize the displayed list. You initialize it with a query response. Why is this public? I'm sure there's a reason, but I just forget. For every entry, we turn the entry into a set of columns. Yeah, this is also called in the kickoff thing. I mean, this is really pretty boilerplate. This is in all of the paginated lists. Yeah, this is probably nothing exciting. I just forget why this is public. Why is... Here. I'll figure out the answers to these questions at some other later time. Or, you know, later during this review. Login. Okay, there's a login page and the user needs a login page because I'm requiring them to provide a password. Now, yes. And I'm requiring to them to provide a password because I didn't want to put the password in code. That would be stupid. That would be the worst thing I could do. Uh, because it gets published to GitHub and you can't get rid of that history forever. Well, I mean, I, I suppose I'm sure there's a way, but I don't, uh, I don't know how. I could just delete the repository. There you go. That's a solution, right? Uh, ooh, we have a lot of things. We have a lot of things in here. Why do we have so many things? Uh, there's a username input. There's a password input. Okay, these are like big chunks. Okay, all right. This TS ignores probably because of this dot parent thing. Okay, and then there's a submit button. Okay, 
And this is if this is the first time it's loading, we add the CSS classes. Yeah, that makes sense. And then when you click the submit button, what does it do? It gets the username and the password. Oh yeah, this is a little bit unique because it has to get both va both values at the same time. And then it's kind of like a form. Should I be using some kind of form logic? Eh, probably not. This is fine. Uh, if they're they need to both be strings. And then if it's not obfuscated, set it to the password. Right, yeah, so I added this unique thing where I'm thinking a user might accidentally come onto the login page to see like, oh, did I remember to input my password? Is my password still there? Uh, and if they open the login page, I don't know, I don't want to, first of all, I don't want the, to display them, their password, just like blah, right there, if they're not making any changes to it. Um, like if someone, God forbid, decides to stream my game, like I don't want them to show, show and publicize that password by accident, right? So uh, they need to be able to come in and leave um, without it, without it, fundamentally altering their, their password. Uh, and I think this also lets them change just their username, right? Yeah, they can change just their username and not change the password and it'll be totally fine. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a nice little extra thing. It's not totally essential. I could have been more of a jerk, but I think for me to be more of a jerk and be more restrictive would have required a lot more code. Uh, I think, yeah, does that make sense? Well, yeah, cause they would have gone to like edit the username and then maybe I would have immediately deleted what was in their password thing. And that would have clued them in that they have to re put it in, but that would be annoying. Okay. And the office gate thing replaces it with, with this dot, the, the dot character, which is fun. It's funny to see a dot in code. That's a rare thing. And it's blank if it's undefined. So if they haven't set it, it should just be blank. Yeah, that's that's fairly straightforward. It's fairly straight. There were just some edge cases that I needed to handle. Okay. Uh, what changed here? Oh, interesting. So this is a this is an optimization I did, or like an improvement, I guess. I wanted a, an extra wide button to have its own CSS class because I used it in multiple places. Yeah, I think I made the login button be like as wide as the key bindings quick start button. So now I needed to, I needed to reuse that CSS. And the reset button also was the same the same idea yeah that's fine i don't know realistically whether it's better to have a different css class for every ui element that seems bad <laughs> or to reuse css classes and it seems more sensible to reuse these css classes because at least this is a little bit this is a little bit descriptive whereas this is like oh i don't know what what css i'm adding to this thing it's a complete mystery, but where where this it's like oh it's it's full width. I guess that means it's wider than than regular buttons. Okay, that's intuitive. That makes sense. And then yeah, okay, this is simple. I added the login button. The login button goes to the login page. Yes, totally reasonable. Great. What is this? Oh, this is I relocated the file and all the imports had to change naturally. And what is this? I added a page. I added the leaderboard page and the login page. Right. Right, because the leaderboard thing is, is one page, even though it's accessible for multiple places in the, in the UI. A little bit weird, a little bit, a little bit strange logic. The idea of passing information between pages is it's kind of tricky, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, I think I'm okay how I've handled it so far. But I'm sure there's there like there's there's a there's like a paradigm there's a, that I'm not using that might be better. <clears throat> what did I do with the playing display? I relocated. This is probably related to the storage. Oh, the uh, after you finish playing, you need to yeah okay. So let me. At the end of a song, you submit your score. That makes sense. And what do we do? We get the key. We hash all of the note information in order to get the song hash. And then we make a database client. And then we put, we save the, we submit the score. Okay. That's, that's okay ish. I recently had a user ask to, change this to be a button rather than just the default behavior that you do at the end of every song. So maybe I need, I'm going to take out this logic and put it somewhere else soon. We'll see. Well, I mean, not we'll see like that seems likely from at this point. Play from file. Uh, this is a page. Okay, this is, oh, right. I added the leaderboard button to the play from file and play from online so that you can click and see the leaderboards for the song that you're about to play. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so they've selected a mode because if they haven't selected a mode, then we're not going to know the song hash because each mode has different notes. Yep. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah, and when you, when you click the button, what does it do? It gets the key from the tracks after you do finish parsing. Right, and it, I remember it being a little bit weird to do parsing in a different context. And that probably, did I have to mess with this, this stuff, these things up here? No? Okay. Well, that's good. That's fortunate. Yeah, I do parsing in both cases. I do finish parsing, um, where is it? When they click play, they finish parsing. And when they do this, they finish parsing, which is a bit of redundant work, but well, I can have some flag that says like, Hey, have you finished parsing it yet? Um, what are, what is the possible problem with that? Yeah, maybe I could come back and fix that. That's like low priority, but yeah, maybe I could do that. Um, I assume that play from online is going to have the same issue, but besides that, it looks okay. Play from online. Huh? Yeah, this one makes me tilt my head a little bit, but I think it's because what could that be? Is it? Oh, okay. I think it's because I, this is like the song name and the difficulty and maybe some other thing. And I, this was like an oversight when I switched to tables, I didn't, I didn't remember to do this switch. Uh, and so this was probably always meant to be there and I just forgot about it. That's what I'm going to guess. Kick off load song, loaded song name. 
uh, right. This would only matter if um, this only affects what gets displayed on the results screen. And now in this case, it affects what gets uploaded to the leaderboards. And that's probably what causes me to notice it or caused me to notice it. And as I alluded to, here's the play from online logic. And let me guess. Let me guess, let me guess. Let me guess. Do, we, do we parse it? We... How do we get the song hash? Song hash is equal to get key from hat, get key from tracks. How do we know the tracks? Oh, we actually, so it's not going to apply to this case because I think the second you click it, the second you click it, it does a parse. Is that right? Well, it says load and play. How are you going to parse it if you haven't loaded it, if you haven't like downloaded it yet, right? Okay. Oh, right here. Well, load, selected song, and disable button. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, so it is redundant in the play from online case as well. Okay. Again, it's a very minor problem. That's just an artifact. That's an artifact. This is public. Results display. Ooh, this was probably some compromise that I didn't like doing, right? Results display has a public current score. Hmm. Oh, I don't know why that's public. Why does results display have a public current score? I don't know. Maybe we'll see in a minute. Storage list. Uh, oh, thank God I put that semicolon there. Storage util, this is where I moved some code because I'm using it for more than just local storage now. And <laughs> I have to laugh at myself a little bit because I'm not really using testing, even though I have a, I did mess with jest a little bit and I could probably write jest uh, tests at this point. Uh, but I was so worried about the password logic working that my obfuscation stuff that I did end up writing some test cases and they just kind of live here lonely never being used uh, I mean I do use this but I only I like run it once and then I completely forget about it I don't run it on on every subsequent change which mostly defeats the point of, of having unit tests but uh, you know I mean there's no excuse it's just laziness it's stupid. but I want to develop quickly. I want to go fast. I'm developing too fast for unit tests. And then this is, I had to add this as an external. Why do you have to have that as a, I don't think, is it because there's no types for it? Is that right? No, no, it's because I didn't, um, I don't want to have to serve this myself in my uh, the thing that people download, I want I want them to download it from from like AWS's uh, server. You know, every time they load the page, it'll be loaded. What do they call that? A server that hosts the JavaScript stuff. This this will tell them to load it so that I don't the a CDN. Yes, this is their CDN. Okay, great. Yeah, that's everything. Uh, mostly a pretty good block of code. I'm pretty happy with it uh, in retrospect.
kind of surprised uh, considering I remember being incredibly desperate to get this out. I think this was just before I started my new job. So like go figure, it makes sense that I would be desperate to get this out because uh, I anticipated being really busy, which has come true, has come to fruition. My prediction was accurate. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, well, that's everything. I'll see you next time.